Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit today about bugs for bugs, so everything about peatlands and insects to do with them. So we have 40,000 species of invertebrates in the UK, if not more, one of which is this lovely ladybird spider, which you see down south. And some of them are incredibly colourful. Of these 40,000 plus species, 26,000 of them are found in Scotland. That accounts for more than 85% of all Scottish biodiversity. So that's not just animal biodiversity, that's including plants and fungi, which, as you can imagine, is an absolutely impressive amount. Bugs, uh, bugs rule the world, and even if, if, if only we all knew it. <laughs> So that includes things for, such as widespread species, like the orange tip, which we'll be seeing soon this spring, and rare species such as the freshwater pearl mussels that you find in rivers uh, throughout Scotland. Uh, we do have internationally important populations of several species, such as these. Our invertebrates have all sorts of services, like I mentioned earlier. Pollination is the one that most people are aware of, but they also manage soil as well as nutrient cycling. Waste management, they help to control pest species, as well as being food for us and other animals. Now, as you can imagine, with there being 26,000 species, they occupy every kind of habitat you can imagine in the UK. One of which is peatlands, which is what I'm concerned with. So I'm now going to tell you a little bit about peatlands and how they work. Um, so 3% of the earth is covered in peat. But of this 3%, 25%, so a quarter of all carbon that is stored in the ground is, is in the 3% of under covering the earth, which is absolutely amazing and impressive considering all of the forests across the world. As you can see on the right hand side here, uh, the orange uh, indicates where there is peat in Scotland and it covers rather a lot. There used to be more, but unfortunately, over many years, we have less. And the orange just indicates the deep peat. There is also more peat that's just shallow. I think this covers over 20% of Scotland. Now, peatlands are created through this wonderfully miracle plant called sphagnum. It's a lovely moss. There are 34 species of it in Scotland. So as you can imagine, quite hard to tell the difference in some respects, and also really varied. They, uh, interestingly, can also have autumn colours. So you see here on this one, there's quite a lot of red in the middle. middle. Sometimes they change to autumn colours like the trees. Sphagnum that builds peat tends to grow at the peat at one millimetre a year. So if you can imagine one millimetre a year of peat growing on an active bog, 10 times that equals one centimetre, so 10 years is one centimetre of peat. 10 times that is 10 centimetres of peat, which is 100 years. So a metre of peat is a thousand years worth of peatland that creation. Most peatlands across Scotland, uh, raised bogs especially, uh, are between five and 10 metres deep. This is because in the last ice age, the end of the last ice age was when peatlands started getting created again. So 10 metres deep of peat is 10,000 years worth of peatland. Um, as you can imagine, it takes a long time to replace 10 metres of peat. <laughs> Another 10 years, see you all in, in 10,000 years time. <laughs> so for peatlands, there are lots of different types of peatlands. They're all created by sphagnum but in all sorts of different ways. There are quaking bogs, like you get up on the flows in the north. There are fens, which are more nutrient rich and very, uh, sometimes have more open water, as well as raised bogs and blanket bogs. I'm gonna show you a little video now that explains a lot better than I could because it shows very well how raised bogs are formed. And this is from the IUCN project.
Okay, start off with the leg. And it starts filling in from the edges. This shows you a cross section of how it starts. Over time, the water gets less and less. And the peak starts getting in the shallower bits of the basin. You get really interesting margin habitat. The middle starts growing sphagnum that creates peat. Sorry. And it starts rising from the middle outwards, usually creating a droplet of water shape as if it was on a surface like a table. And now there's no more lake water left or loch water, there's just the water from the rainfall. And again, you can see the exaggeration of this droplet in as we look down on it. And there's it in a lovely 3D side view. So this is what intact vault race bogs should look like. So as you see there, or you saw before the more videos popped up, there is a lovely dome shape to this and generally spherical. Um, sorry, let me just let people join me. Um, and this is very typical of a bog. You can start at the edge and you can look towards the center and you can't see the other side quite often. So Unfortunately, there's not a lovely little video with 3D graphics for blanket bogs, but they grow on top of hills and uh, right at the tops where there's more water than it can handle. Um, this picture on the left hand side shows a fairly intact blanket bog right at the top of the hill. As you can see, there's no trees, it's really low vegetation, there's lovely bog pools and of course an abundance of sphagnum. Blanket bog covers about 23% of Scotland and Scotland holds 15% of the world's blanket bog. So as you can imagine, that's a rather large amount for us to hold just in our, our one country. So why are bogs important? Bogs are important for a whole host of reasons. One of which is that if nothing else, they help greatly with water flow. They act like a giant sponge. So when it rains quite often, especially on the top of the hills, they soak up the water and then they release it slowly over time. As you can imagine, if you take these bogs away or you put drainage ditches in, this water instead runs straight down the hill to the floodplains, to the houses, and you end up like these poor people here 
who have very wet gardens and probably very wet lower levels. On top of that, they store actively store carbon when they're in a, a pristine state or a recovering state, which is great in the context of climate change, as it can help us take more carbon out of the air and store it more in the ground. However, when they're degraded, they start emitting carbon and then they become a carbon source, almost worse than us driving around in cars and burning forests down. And lastly, but not least, they're really important for their biodiversity. Because they're such specialist habitats with acidic conditions, they're waterlogged, there's no oxygen below the surface, uh, there's little light below the surface, the first 10 centimetres, so uh, it results in some really interesting specialists, such as all the things found on this slide, adders, bog rosemary, cranberry, sundew, bog asphodel, not to mention all of the invertebrates. Speaking of the invertebrates, especially just on bogs, 51 species live only on blanket bogs, not anywhere else, they're very specialised to them. And 63 species of invertebrate are specialised on lowland raised bogs, which is a humongous amount, if you can imagine. Uh, everything from spiders through to dragonflies and caddisflies, you'll see out there. One of these species is this lovely bog pseudoscorpion, which is absolutely minute. Uh, the only way you're going to find this little thing is if you take a putter out and put it in the top little layer of the sphagnum and accidentally took it up. It's really cute. Now, these aren't actually scorpions. They're just, like the name says, they're, they're fake scorpions. They look scorpion-like, but they're not. Quite often they are herbivorous and they live in just the top couple of centimetres of the sphagnum. It is possible also that there are species that we haven't found because sphagnum and bogs are such hard accessible places, as well as who would think to look something maybe a millimetre long, if not shorter. Another spectacular species that we have is the bog sun jumper spider. Now this is found in our area, this is on Berlin. Again, you'd hardly know it was there unless you accidentally came across it. Uh, this is a very minute spider, only a couple of millimetres long. It's got absolutely brilliant yellow legs and lovely iridescent shining body. And a lot cuter than you'd expect for a spider. I mean, look at the little face, the lovely little hairy palps. Another species that lives around sphagnum and bogs is the ten-spotted pot beetle. Now I was out doing surveys for this last summer up in the Cairngorms and it's very particular in where it lives. Only in eared willow of one metre in height or less on top of sphagnum. And you can imagine due to Covid unfortunately we weren't there whilst the adults were out, but the little pot beetle larva um, the mother creates a little pot out of her own poo and then she, she lays an egg in there and the larva lives in there until it's an adult. Um, and then particularly for 10 spotted pot beetles, they live in the leaf layer on the top of the sphagnum. So you can imagine going and looking for something about a centimetre long, if not less, that's brown and poop shaped with a little larva sticking out of it. Uh, it's not the easiest of things to find, but well worth a look. These only live in three sites across Britain currently. We're looking for more, but only three sites. Um, other species that you get are things like the northern emerald dragonfly takes advantage of bog pools, as well as the white-faced garter, um, which lives up in the north. A lovely white face here, red. It's a stunning creature when you see it. The large heath butterfly specialises on hairstail cotton grass. So you'll also only find that on bogs, uh, particularly if the bogs don't flood in winter because the larva spend quite a lot of time at the bottom of the plant. And then you can imagine if it floods, they, they struggle to find places not to drown. But a uh, lovely butterfly. Uh, other Lepidoptera moths, like these beautiful emperor moths, Argent and Sable, Iranic Brindle Beauty, 
which this is the male and it has a lovely female form it's really unusual where it has no wings and it looks very odd because there's no wings it's just this little furry thing she climbs up on fence posts fence posts and waits for the male to come to find her other species that you wouldn't necessarily think uh, this is a caddis fly the window wind sedge now if anybody could see these or finds one if you could send a picture in where they found it that would be brilliant um, these are currently under recorded and we really need to see where more of them are um, on top of that there are lovely little water beetles such as uh, this helipus species that you find in in bogs and the bog reed beetle this lovely iridescent specimen here unfortunately a lot of peatlands have threats um, everything from afforestation to drainage gullies to harvesting to too many livestock i'm going to go into a little bit more detail about some of these threats so back uh, last century there was a scheme by the government to plant trees on peatlands because they were seen as useless habitats and no use for anybody and they possibly they would be good for planting trees um, however most of these trees don't grow to the height that's harvestable they cause cracking they evaporate water off the bog which can then degrade the bog even earlier more uh, historically there hasn't been any afforested peatlands across Scotland or very few so it's not native to, to our area and causes a lot of disruption I'm going to show you another really good IUCN video on this topic. video showed you just how valuable peatlands are for storing carbon and although it showed trees on the bog which many peatlands do have it's just not what we have in Scotland.
I think it's very important to plant the right trees in the right places. This is one of my project bogs down in Falkirk on the Salmanen Plateau. Um, this was winter, Christmas 2019, before the pandemic, and got lovely volunteers along to come and help me take some of these trees off because they're evaporating so much water off that the bog can't keep up and it's drying out. Uh, another severe issue with peatlands is quite a lot of them have deep drainage ditches as people try to convert them for farming, for forestry, for all sorts of things and again this drains all of the water out and once it starts draining the water out the sides start collapsing in and once the sides start collapsing in it eats further and further back and then the, lo the lower the water table gets the lower the moss um, is if you remember earlier, I said it's like a sponge, so the less water in it, the less height it will have. The lower it is, the less likely it is to hold more water, and then it ends up in a negative feedback loop until somebody alters that. Okay. Uh, another one of the major problems with peatland restoration, peatlands and damages at the minute is fire. So uh, I've got another lovely video for you to watch regarding this, it explains what happens. Thank <laughs> you. 
brown water there indicates that there's a damaged peatland upstream. Not necessarily always through burning, but it's peat particulate matter that's been washed out, whether it be through burning or through drainage. It shouldn't generally be that colour. Uh, lastly, I'm going to talk about horticulture. This is the main problem these days with peatland. Uh, the main threat to peatland is the use of peat in compost in people's gardens and in horticulture as a whole. This is lethem moss. Um, was once a lovely raised bog like we saw earlier in that video. It's now been stripped almost completely. So no invertebrates can live there anymore. It's not a sink for water anymore. The water drains off it. In fact, it's leaking carbon because there's a little bit of um, peat left. It's all exposed, as you can see from this, go uh, this Google map view. Um, it's not great, to be honest. <laughs> so uh, I must stress that if you are buying compost for your garden, please, please, please buy stuff that has no peat in. No matter how sustainable some packets might claim, it is not sustainable, especially when you consider that it takes a year to grow a millimeter, 10 years to grow a centimeter, 100 years to grow 10 centimeters, and a thousand years to grow a meter. If you can imagine how much compost, how much peat compost is in one bag, how fast that grows, and how long it takes to replace. It's not something that we can keep on continuing using. These are some, some of the alternatives. There are many. Um, I think some people even buy some substrates and they add their own uh, acidity or whatever they need for what they're planting. And then, of course, if we stop doing stripping of the peat, you end up with lovely bugs like this with large heath on and sunbog jumping spid uh, spiders and cotton grass, far as the eye can see. They're very beautiful when they're all going in the summer. Like I said, these threats are not just threats because of what we've already explained, but this is some of the visual impacts that you see. Um, running of, of drains coming off, severe erosion as the peatland gets washed away, humongous gullies taller than you could be. And even as of a couple of months ago, many of you might have seen in the news that there was a peat slide in Ireland that covered a vast array and buried quite a lot of land and peat as it gives away. So away from all of the doom and gloom, we'll get on to a few of Bug Life's peatland restoration projects. So this is Fannyside Muir, you can find it on the Salmanan Plateau to the east of Cumbernauld and to the south of Falkirk. This is a project from 2016, 2017, over 240 hectares of site was worked on um, between contractors, as you can see here, and lovely volunteers, as you can see here, including me at the time, as Scott Shanks led this project and I was one of the volunteers. 4,100 dams were installed across the whole lot, uh, creating 27 hectares of bog pools, and it's now favourable growth for sphagnum. 90% of it, so almost 100% back. Uh, and it's an absolutely brilliant place with over 800 species recorded, of which 552 of them are invertebrates, just to show you the proportion. Lovely things like heavy heather calites bee, common hawker dragonfly in the bog pools, small pearl bordered fritillary where there's marshing, and lovely iridescent bog beetle. That ditch that I showed you earlier, this was it just after we put some restoration work in. So these are plastic peat dams with bracing to stop the weight of the water pushing them out. Uh, this was taken a couple of years ago now, so as I can imagine that this would look even better. The sphagnum will start colonising these pools um, and then that will start building up and more stuff will come back. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get out to take another photo of this ditch, otherwise you'd have a, a couple of years on to compare. But it's doing absolutely brilliantly. 
My current project is working on other bogs in the region of the Sulmanen Plateau. So up here to the north, this is Falkirk, this is Cumbernauld, there is Fanny side that I was just mentioning. We're working on nine bogs in the Sulmanen Plateau region, and this is for a number of reasons. One is the degraded due to past uh, pressures such as burning, peat mining, etc. from what we're showing, as well as the fact that once these are restored, it creates a lovely link up across the landscape of islands that species can hop between rather than being stuck in individual bogs without suitable habitat in between to make the jump. Uh, the plan for these nine bogs is a whole bunch of restoration and re-wetting works from plastic peat dams, as you can see down here, this is the sphagnum building up behind it, to peat dams using peat itself, as it can be impermeable, the peat that's not degraded, it acts like a rubber bung and stops the water coming out and then you eventually end up with lovely backfilled dams, uh, ditches like this. Uh, cell bunding was done on Fanny side up here, which is essentially the same as this peat dam here, but on a crosshatch and a large scale to keep more water in. In addition to that, it's extremely important that we keep on monitoring these bogs. The monitoring tells us if what we were doing is right. Um, it tells us if we're increasing species, if we need to do anything else. In particular, dip well surveys, as uh, this lovely volunteer Arthur here is doing, all, we're out in all weathers, as you can see, the snow. Uh, you put a dip well reading meter down until it hits the water and you measure the water levels across the bog. The more variance in the water levels, the more likelihood that there is going to be some sort of damaged bog part nearby. So, for example, if there's a ditch, um, the water levels will vary more over the year. It'll be really flooded in winter, more so than the bog can naturally handle, and it'll be really dry in summer, creating more um, cracks, which I can say are pretty lethal if you're walking across a, a degraded bog and you fall in one of them. Um, in addition to this, we do all sorts of invertebrate surveys from dragonflies to butterfly trans transects and moth, moth mites. How you can help? Well, when there isn't a pandemic going on, quite often we do lots of volunteer parties. Like I mentioned from Christmas uh, 2019, everybody took home their own Christmas tree, a free Christmas tree, if they helped chop it down off the bog. Surveys, we're always looking for help with surveys, the monitoring, the dip well, and please, please, please do use peat free compost in your gardens. How we as bug life help you conserve invertebrates is um, by, if you can join bug life, it supports us. Um, we have a monthly newsletter called Scottish Invertebrate News. Recently, we've done a whole series of absolutely brilliant invertebrate workshops based around caddis flies, stone flies, um, beetles, all sorts of species groups that you wouldn't necessarily normally get. You can find those on our YouTube page, as well as hab habitat management workshops, fact sheets, etc. So please do contact us if you're interested. And that's me for my talk. Pass back the host to Ali, if I can. If I can find him. Ready for some questions. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Cool, perfect. Well, uh, first of all, just uh, I'd like to say um, thank you, Melissa. That was a fabulous talk. Um, it was really interesting. Um, your the videos were really cool as well. Getting to see um, and really good at like explaining what what can be complicated um, processes and things. So they were really good. And yeah, thanks for the update on everything Bug Life's been doing with their peatland restoration work. Um, so we've had a few questions in the chat box. Um, so if you want to have a wee look at that, I've um, written them out as well. Um, so I'll start off with uh, one from. Uh, myself, just a little 
bit of a fun one. Um, you mentioned several um, invertebrate species that are associated with peatland. And I was just wondering, do you have a favourite one out of the ones that you mentioned? Or do you have one that you're like, oh, I'd really like to see that one day on like one of the bogs that you've restored? I think that bog beetle that I showed, the really iridescent red one, I would absolutely oh. love to see. Just because it's so fantastic. Um, I. I would like to see the sunbog jumper spider, but ironically, I'm a little bit scared of spiders, so <laughs> maybe it wouldn't be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was at university, I did a big study on bogs in central Scotland on large heath. So large heath butterfly, it's very close to my heart because I spent a long time looking for them. Um, and they're, they're very pretty when you see them. You spot them on a bog a mile off and you go, ah, I want to catch that and you run after it with your net looking like a, a crazy person, but they're really rewarding to find. Oh, that's lovely to hear. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, so we had um, a question in um, asking about some of the aspects around um, burning. Um, yeah. So it was just a question around like, is it accidental fires or is it associated with a particular land management um, Set, uh, set that it happens. So it's a combination of both. The ones in Falkirk these days aren't burnt at all for a land management purpose. Um, none of the bogs that we're restoring are. However, there is quite a lot of antisocial behaviour in the area and that can lead to fires happening on the bogs, especially since they're already in a degraded, a degraded position. Um, because they're so dry, they're prone to being burned. Um, uh, it can be also asso associated with grouse moors, but they are working on licensing that, so it shouldn't happen. Um, no, that's perfect, thank you. Um, that um, kind of answers the next question as well, about um, uh, why is it still legal to burn heather on it. But as you mentioned, this is getting um, licensed and um, the next Scottish um, government have um, promised that they will license that. Yeah. Um, Historically, it was a traditional practice. So, um, there was also another question about um, why there's commercial forestry allowed on peatland still, um, and I don't know if you've got um. A so there's commercial forestry isn't allowed to be planted on peatland anymore unless it is restocking what was already there. So any peatland that is deeper than half a meter, it is illegal to plant forestry on it. However, if there is forestry already on the site and it's of a um, significant level. So some trees can grow pretty tall on some peatlands. It just depends on the situation of the bog. Um, they need to restock it to be able to keep the forestry cover at a level in Scotland. Okay, thank you for your uh, responding to that. Um, so I've got another question, is, um, it's about uh, Letham Moss. Um, and is it too late for the, the peatland there or is it, would it be possible to restore that, do you think? Unfortunately, I've not gone to visit myself, so I can't really make an opinion on that. Um, okay. It was just the nearest one that I knew that had a, a very demonstrative Google map. Yeah, yeah. I actually was on Google Maps the other day and I happened just to be looking at it and I was like, oh, I know what's happening there. That's horrendous. Yeah, um, <laughs> unfortunately it is. So, the, and we had another question about where have the peat fires been happening? They can happen anywhere and everywhere, to be perfectly honest. Um, even earlier this year, the, there was lots of fires on the west coast because it was so dry. It just depends on how damaged the bog is and whether it's a commercial activity or not, or whether it's accidental due to antisocial behaviour, or if people are just camping and lighting fires and not knowing that it's a bad idea or how to put them out. Okay. Um, so another question here. Um, how long do the plastic dams last and are there any more or less effect, more or less effective in the longer term than peat dams? So plastic dams take a lot shorter time to put in than the peat dams and it also depends on the quality of your peat. So if you have a degraded peat, if it's a, a bog that's in a degraded position, you have to dig quite deep to be able to get to the good one that actually holds the water rather than letting it through. Um, plastic dams can last 
quite a long time, but it also depends on the weight of the water. Sometimes they get blown out at the bottom. Okay. Yeah. Um, next, we've got another question here from um, about trees at Flanders Moss. Um, and that the, there are trees currently spreading across Flanders Moss. Um, will the water levels there kill them off? Um, it depends what area they're in. If it's very flooded, uh, generally they'll either grow really stunted. Um, so one of my bogs is partial quaking bog and it's very, very wet. So quaking bogs, if you fall through the surface, you can literally swim underneath. They're very dangerous to walk across. If there are parts like that on, on Western, uh, not Western, sorry, on Flanders, and especially a lot of it is now being rewetted and they're continually doing work on it, Nature Scots. So I would imagine that they would either die off or become extremely stunted and not, not quite as much. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so what are the best bogs in central Scotland for people to visit? There's obviously Flanders Moss, which is well known, but are there any others you can recommend? So not currently, but uh, in the future, one of our bogs, Howie Rig, which is based at Canada Wood, is going to have a boardwalk. So you'll be able to visit oh, there. Um, that would be really good. Um, there's a couple more that have boardwalks, but I can't remember what their names are off the top of my head. There's a few. You should be able to search uh, Peatland, Boardwalks, Nature Scott, and they might come up. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, is there a question around, is there a national campaign to stop places from selling peat compost? There is actually, Bug Life has one. Um, the major garden centres did agree to voluntarily try to phase it out, however that's not been successful. Um, I think it's possibly due to a lack of education and a lack of willingness from their side necessarily. Um, hopefully it'll happen in the near future. Okay. Fingers crossed. Thanks for that. Um, so is it just Falkirk um, where Bug Life have volunteering associated with bog restoration or do you have any other areas that you're um, in the pipeline that you're looking to do more work on? As far as bog work, currently only Falkirk. Um, that project should be going on until 2023 now. So it takes up most of my time being uh, nine bogs. <laughs> they're, they're quite a lot to handle. Yeah, I can imagine there's a lot of work associated and each site must be slightly different with what it needs yeah. and things. So, um, Do the plastic dams get removed eventually and if so, and if they do, how long would that be? Currently they're still just left in there. They, they should be in it. The bog, when it's, fit, when it's uh, restored, doesn't have any running water so the plastic particles can't go anywhere. Um, as far as I'm aware, they, I don't think I've ever seen any. They'd be very hard to get out, certainly. Eventually, they just end up covered over in sphagnum and then they're part of the bog um, from there on. Um, we have um, a question here. Um, uh, it's not related to any bog stuff. Um, it's just a question wondering, have you always been interested in bugs and how did you get into your current job? I'd say I've always been interested in specific bugs like butterflies um, and I've definitely always been interested in wildlife but when I went to university in Stirling I was part of the Stirling University Nature Society and we all got addicted to moths and then my love for bugs kind of just took off from there and now now you just you can't see me going back <laughs> everything <laughs> I see is just what's that I want to know what that is I want to go and see all of the exciting invertebrates Ah, lovely. Um, cool. Um, one other question, um, going back to the peatland restoration stuff. Um, can wood, wood be used as an alternative to plastic dams? Wood can be used, however, uh, quite often it leaks. I think it's a lot better used up on um, blanket bulbs because you don't want to hold back all of the water up there, so it doesn't really matter so much. But um, on lowland raised bogs, like the ones in Falkirk, you don't really want any water going out, or at least not very much at all, just a slow seepage like it would naturally. Okay, perfect, thank you. 
Um, okay, so one last question and then uh, we'll sum up for the evening. Um, so are you able to quantify how much peatland um, bug life has restored so far and how much you plan to have restored hopefully by the end of the project? So there's the 240 hectares that was restored in Funnyside. Um, we have restored one bog since then um, towards more towards Cumbernauld and that is, if I remember correctly, between 15 and 20 hectares. Okay. Um, so that would be between 250 50. and 265. So not a small area then. No. That's um, about two. And planned, there is going to be another, let me try and calculate in my head, 150 to 200 hectares to be restored by the end of the project. Okay, so quite a large area still to be restored, yeah. but like that'd be a, um, a really good habitat once it's all restored. Yeah, and, and it creates it. nice little islands for all of the species to hop between exactly. rather than being isolated. Okay, uh, well thank you again um, Melissa, that was a fabulous talk, so thanks for coming along and giving us that and telling us all about bug life's work. Very um, welcome. I uh, just want to quickly um, say sorry if anybody had any issues getting onto the talk this evening. I'll go away and have a look at what's happened there. Um, but thank you all for joining us um, on, for our March talk. Um, please do keep an eye out for our future talks. Um, if anything does happen, they will be going up on the website and through the Scottish Wildlife Trust website as well. If you are interested in getting involved or hearing more about the, the trust and the work that the trust does and what we do here in the local group, please do check out our websites. If you're interested in any, um, hearing about any of our other talks, most of our the Scottish Wildlife Trust talks have been recorded. So please do check out the Scottish Wildlife Trust YouTube channel. Um, and if you are interested in getting more involved with the local group, please do drop any of the committee an email. Um, or if you're not a member yet and you're here long, please do consider um, joining. Um, it really does help the charity in order to do all the amazing work that they do. So again, thanks Melissa for joining us and thanks everybody. I hope you all have a fabulous rest of your evening.